you don't buy a battery without any labels on it. This is very important, okay? Yeah. Because right now in China, some other people was fighting from the, how to say, electronic more than several thousands of battery without any labels on it. They were thinking about this is cheap price. Just why? DLG didn't why would you use... do that? Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of our Canberra podcast, where we chat all things related to RC sailplanes with prominent pilots, designers, event organizers, and other awesome guests. Camber Up is now available in several different formats, so you can tune in however you want. We will continue to have these full-length video podcasts available through our uh, YouTube channel, Armsor, and is now also available as full-length audio podcasts through Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So you can listen to it during your commute or in a gym, etc. Just search for Camber Up. And lastly, I understand sometimes you might not have enough time to catch the entire episode. So on our YouTube channel, under the brand new Camber Up Clips playlist, we will be uploading clips from the previous week's podcast, organized and titled by topic for easy searching and consumption. Now, Nick Wu was with us last week, and we have some unfinished business. So today, in episode three, we have Nick back with us again to chat about what kind of equipment you need to start flying DLGs. We're going to talk about the first DLG you should be buying, what radios work for DLG, what kinds of receivers you need, what servos fit the bill, and what kind of batteries are suited. Okay, before we get started, if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you hit the like button and hit subscribe so you don't miss our next videos. Ethical disclaimer, I am the owner of Armsor, which is the sponsor of this channel and pays for all of the videos that are produced on this channel, which is named Armsor including the Camber Up podcast, RC Glider Basics, and tutorial videos. We're also going to be talking about equipment from several other brands today, such as KST, Spectrum, Free Sky, Futaba, etc. Both Nick and myself are KST-sponsored pilots, and almost all of our other equipment is provided for us to use either for free or at significant discounts. That said, none of the brands, including KST, has any editorial control over what we talk about, and are not even aware we're going to be talking about them in today's podcast. Also, keep in mind, everyone will have slightly different criteria on their equipment choice, so what works for us may not necessarily be perfect for you, but we'll explain what we're looking for and why, so you can get a better understanding of why we chose our recommendations. All right, boring stuff out of the way. Nick, welcome back. Yeah, it's nice to see you again. We This episode, we want to talk about the some radios, uh, gears, gliders choices for beginner because I talked with Thomas about it uh, in the last uh, episode about a lot of things that in China, I do a lot of work promoting the sports. So I meet a lot of new guys and there was thousands of questions about how to begin the DLG. So in this episode, I want to talk with uh, Thomas about uh, what advices and what suggestion we should make to the the people who want to step in our sports. So uh, we can start with some topics maybe? Yeah, well, the first thing, the biggest thing that people are usually asking is what plane should I get, right? If I'm just starting in DLG, what's the first plane I need to purchase? So I think that kind of splits down. So are you just new to DLG or are you new to RC in general? So let's talk about new to yeah. RC first. What would you recommend for someone who is just getting into radio control? Yeah, we have some guys never fly any other RC models before, and they saw us flying in the uh, airfield, and they are so interesting how cool it is, especially the FEK and the, the big one, the FIJ. So uh, some, some of the guys was new into DLG or soaring market without any experience in other categories. In this uh, condition, I would suggest those guys to start some simulator flying first before he really want to join our radio control things. Because if he didn't have enough knowledge about how to fly and models, probably in the very first day, he will damage all the gears he bought, especially the air models. Because it, when, when you're new into the one uh, sp specific uh, sport that needs some basic skills to fly well or fly 
at least without crash or damages, you, you may need some basic skills. So for those kind of people, I would strongly suggest them to start with some Fumi models or maybe a secondhand DLG is possible if you really have someone teach you every time in the fire field. What do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, simulators are going to be really good. Um, the biggest challenge for anyone who is brand new to RC is up and down and more importantly, left and right. Because remember, the point of view yeah. is very different between, you know, when you're going away from you, left is left, right is right, just like when you're driving. But when you're coming back or when yeah. you're going side to side, it can look reversed. And if you're just starting RC, mm. that is probably the biggest challenge. And once you get the hang of the left and right up and down, then I would suggest going mm. to you know, your first trainer and as you said uh, i would recommend something foamy uh, so that you can crash yeah. and it'll bounce back it's not going to break very easily uh, something that is self-stabilized yeah. uh, either electronically through a gyro or something that is just very stable in design without any gyro and you're probably going to be choosing something with an electric motor so you can get out of trouble if you need it now that's for someone who is mm. completely into uh, new into radio control for yeah. people who have RC experience and are starting into DLG, what would you recommend as their first DLG? For some people who already manage how to fly the other category, like the FEA or some other electronic things, I will recommend them to use a second hand uh, from local pilot, especially from some people who had already in our community to teach you how to fly the models. Because I find out some guys, especially that he has some experience in other categories. He always his, has his own idea about how to get a model and how easy the gliders can be. And then I, I have a lot of people was, uh, how to say that, they have some experience in another category and then they start to fly DLG and find out that they crash their model very easy in the very first week or maybe one week or two. Because soaring is, especially without uh, motors, that kind of air models can be very different from the, the models with power. So uh, the habit, he, he control the other models may be not suitable to find the non-power gliders. Some habit need to be changed and also he need to learn how to uh, set up the models because DLG and gliders, most of the gliders can be very complicated in, in radio settings, which we will talk about later about this topic. But I was always very difficult to see a pilot that will always follow the instruction from our experienced DLG pilot to, to they, they always have, no, I don't think it's very, difficult to find you look at you, oh, you I need like a runner. very slow so slow <laughs> yeah yeah I, I can control it very well i don't see i can i will damage them and then they will crash <laughs> i see too many too many samples of that yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah so for the for the beginner uh no matter if you are new or you are has maybe years of flying other uh, rc categories do follow the instruction because in the LG community, most of the people don't don't fool you and will not make how to say <laughs> we will not introduce you to a wrong side. Mostly we will we will tell the very true and those for the most part, can be very yeah. For the, <laughs> for the most there part. are some people you know that give very questionable suggestions, but I mean there are usually multiple ways to do something. But you will yeah, normally yeah. see the cons a consensus of a one way <laughs> that has a lot more people yeah. doing it, and usually just follow that way, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah don't yeah, be stubborn. It's always to see. Yeah, it's always happy to see some guys learn lessons after <laughs> you know that no matter land on trees or open the uh, launch the glider without open the radio or maybe it's. Uh, uh, power burns up and, and hit hit the grounds. I see too many accidents happen in the very beginning of the of the DLG flight, especially uh, without the motors. For for motor spider like the uh, F5J and F5K, those are a little bit easier because you have the motor control. 
but for non-power gliders, like especially like DLG, when you launch it, some people will think it's too easy, and then he launch it and he break it right after he launch it. Yeah, because there is so a very reasons. there is a very different aspect to DLG. Not only is it empowered, but there's a physical aspect to it, and there is some sort yeah. of logistic and process to your launch that you have to really get down until it becomes second nature, like any other sport. Just to summarize, so yeah. your recommendation is to buy used 1.5 meter uh, DLG uh, from a local, preferably, because someone will, well, they will be able to show you the ropes. And yeah, local, from fun. local is very important. Because for, for the beginning phases of the DLG learning, it's very difficult to learn it by yourself. Even you have some knowledge from the forum of some from the internet. But still, when you really try trying it, uh, some people from local can help you improve a lot and help you to avoid some accident, which you, you will be happen when you're flying alone. So I think a local pilot, second hand, one meter or 1.5, doesn't matter. Only if you, you need to know, I always tell uh, some beginners, no matter whether he have experience or not, or just new to the, the DLG, I will talk to them. The first model you got, it will be 100% damaged within one month if you keep flying it every weekend. I didn't see anyone can, can avoid that because in the very beginning phases, there are so many accidents can be happen in, in, in learning to fly the, the, the DLG or some other gliders things. It's not if, it's when would you damage it. You will. You will absolutely yeah. damage your first yeah. model. So yeah. don't grow too attached to it. Obviously, when you're building it, if it's new uh, or whatever, you want to do the best you can because it's a learning process. But don't grow too, too attached to it. Mm. Now, it's very, I can attest to how important it is to have someone local flying with you uh, to show you the ropes if that's a mm. possibility. Because when I first started, um, we, we kind of talked about this with Gavin. I was so intimidated uh, <laughs> that... I didn't reach out to the local group that was flying DLG. Um, I built everything through online resources. And then I went to the flying field. And the first day I went to the flying field, I think it was the first or second flight, I smashed it up and I had to go home and fix it. Mm -hmm. And that made me even feel even more intimidated. And <laughs> I, I was even more nervous yeah. about reaching out to local pilots. Like <laughs> Yeah, like, oh, crap, I suck. You know, I don't want to be humiliated. <laughs> so then I continued, you know, hitting yeah. my head against the wall over and over and over again until I got to a reasonable stage where I felt enough self-confidence to reach out. But mm -hmm. looking back at, you know, all the newcomers who have come into the hobby while I've been flying, who mm -hmm. directly came into the hobby and asked around right away, uh, it they improved so much faster and, you know, paid a lot less in lessons uh, in, in yeah. terms of like damaging yeah. models and stuff uh, by doing that. Now, yeah. there are going to be people who do not have access to used models, especially used local models. For example, in Canada, mm. there's just not enough DLG pilots, uh, even in the bigger metro areas. Same thing as the States. There are many uh, cities or areas where there simply are no DLG pilots. Yeah. So mm -hmm. my own recommendation usually is if you cannot get a used one and a half meter or used one meter model, I would say buy a new one meter model. I would very, very rarely recommend buying a new one and a half meter model for your first mm -hmm. DLG. And I know people are, people recommend both sides. Like some people say go with one and a half meter right away. And there is some truth to it. I, uh, the biggest thing is one and a half meter is going to be typically higher performance. And number two, if you screw up your launch uh, technique, you will know right away. So you won't have as much of a tendency to develop bad habits and, on, on your launch. And by bad habits on launch, what I mean is uh, trying to throw up instead of flowing, uh, throwing relatively flat. And the reason that becomes an issue with one and a half meter models is because you will tip strike and everyone tip strikes when yeah. you're starting out. Yeah. Almost everyone tip strikes. And what tip strike means is 
you're launching your plane, and because you're throwing it at an angle, along that plane, the, the swing plane, just like a golf swing, one part of it is going to be low to the ground, and your outer wingtip is going to touch the ground, and you're not going to know what happened because it won't feel like it touched the ground. It's just going to feel like <laughs> something exploded. Right. And when you look yeah. at the wingtip, you're not going to see signs of damage on the wingtip itself, usually anyway, unless you directly hit a rock or something. But as long as you're hitting grass or even dirt, you probably won't see any damage on the outer wingtip, and you won't know what happened. But it's a, it's a tip strike. So for me, I prefer recommending a one-meter model if you're buying brand new because, okay, you might develop bad habits uh, by launching slightly higher angle than proper, but because you won't tip strike a one-meter model no matter how bad your technique is, you are going to have time to figure out the whole launching process, like, uh, you know, uh, turning on the launch preset, letting go of the launch preset, pushing over at the top, you're going to get a lot more airtime because your plane is not going to be damaged. So you're going to be able to start flying and adjusting to how a DLG flies. And that's just the launch yeah. part. The other part is a one meter model, number one, is a lot cheaper than a one and a half meter model. You know, we sell the Deviant. That's a very good point. It, it is. Money is always an issue. We sell the Deviant. It's still significantly cheaper than even the cheapest one and a half meter DLG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Because the, the other size part, matters. Size matters. There's that much less material in it. And the material we use yeah. is very expensive, right? The other yeah. part of it is because it is smaller. Uh, there's a lot less mass to the plane. So if you do have an accident, there's a lot less potential energy there uh, to damage the model. Mm -hmm. And so that's usually why we recommend one meter. So for the for the very first time when you didn't cannot get a local pilot to sell you a secondhand models, I would recommend to order a uh, add a little bit more money to order a RDF model, no matter it's one mm -hmm. meter source uh, of what size, because the building was a little bit complicated for the very beginning when you step into the DLG. Uh, just take me as an example. I was flying a uh first one actually before the the wood wooden models I, I i show in the last episode i bought a foam it, it's another unbuilt top sky mini like half a years ago but when i got the boxes you know when i opened the boxes i saw two two wing there and i didn't know how to use resin to draw the wing together so i just store the, the, the wound package in my house for more than half a year before I finally sell the bosses and change to the RDL models. And then I start to fly the real DLGs. So I will recommend for the very beginning, use a RTF model or second hand because you will see how they put the servers inside, how they join everything together. And you don't need to worry about the building first because building can be very complicated if you didn't have experience in, in gliding or, or some uh, manufacturers and uh, building, that, that kind of things can be can be hard for you to begin. So get a model ready to fly, no matter it's new or not. That's a very important part, I think. Yeah, and I think it's something that we finally have the resources to do, like not just Armsor, but other manufacturers as well. Because in the past, no one made uh, RTF DLGs, right? Uh, not really RTF, it would be receiver mm -hmm. ready. You would still have to provide your receiver and battery. But no one did that even like a year ago, right? Yeah. You had to special order those. Mm -hmm. But it really has, once we started doing that, it really has made an impact on how successful the uh, newcomers are in this hobby. And one of the things we have access to is because we've sell, we've sold thousands of DLGs, you know, in the last few years, we have a lot of data on when the newcomer, because I know most of the people in the hobby. And if a new name comes in and buys a one and a half meter model, the chances of me seeing them continue in this hobby is a lot lower than if they first bought either like a Go Mini or a Deviant or some mm. other one meter model. Yeah. The people who yeah. buy a one meter model first as their first new DLG, the chances are 
I will see them again, either shopping with Armsor because they're happy with the quality and the service that we provide, <laughs> or, you know, let's say they want another plane, but at least they're still flying the hobby. And so I have mm. very hard concrete evidence that starting with a one meter model, if you're buying brand new, is going to be better and you will have better long-term success and staying in the hobby than buying a one and a half meter model. Yeah, the first thing you need to you you need to find out that you have less thing to pay attention to or waste more time to learn how to get it ready to fly or how to you need to know the technique or maybe you need to learn something to feel the fun of soaring first. If you really mm-hmm. feel the fun of soaring, like me, in the very first day when we meet in Shenzhen. Some other guys just uh, give give his second hands uh, models to me, and actually I I fly in that event, and I managed to climb in the thermals in the very first day. That's why I keep flying <laughs> for those so things. Funny. Yeah, that that's like a I cannot describe what the feeling is when you first fly your thermals and climb up. It's like a very amazing things, and then it's I like I just the first think time you this had a is very unique. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so I, and, I think and, just as you said, if you want to see more people in, in the in the sports we we love, we do need to get them uh into easier and safer without many accidents to feel the fun of sorry in the very yeah. beginning time. Because no one starts flying DOG with the purpose of you know building. Uh, or assembling a model, and there are just so I hate Bill now. Marks. Even even now, to to be honest, I don't really like assembling. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are fine models in my in my working bench waiting for me to build. I, I just don't want to do that. I'm so if I, turn this, I just if want I turn to go this, on Friday. <laughs> if I turn this around, I have probably fifteen models on the bench that I need to build, and I haven't even touched fifteen. <laughs> Maybe even more than fifteen. I don't know. Yeah. I I hate building. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, both, I do it we, if I have to. Yeah, we are both lazy MDFK. I know. <laughs> yeah, I prefer to fly. <laughs> the joy for me is in flying. When you're out there at the field, yeah. launching it, you know, hitting heights that you want to, and soaring, mm-hmm. that is where all the fun is for me. Um, and I think yeah. I kind of glazed over this by accident. Is what you said about not really knowing what a build is supposed to look like is very important. Now, that's Mm -hmm. actually something you have to be careful of if you're buying used from the community because I have seen a lot of models that are built like crap. Sorry, it's just (laughs) bad. And you might learn learn a lot of improper techniques uh, if you Mm -hmm. use that as a reference for your next build. So yeah. when you shop around for your first local used DLG, make sure you look at a couple different options, right? Before you make your decision and kind of yeah, reference, yeah, yeah. yeah, reference some of the professional builds that you see online to those used builds to make sure that uh, it's kind of in line with what should be expected. Now, if at you're least buying, a, it looks acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. At least it has to look acceptable. If you see, okay, actually, yeah. let's talk about some of the things that they should look out for for a bad build mm. because they might not know. Mm. Um, number one, you want to make sure <laughs> you want to make sure that the linkages are tight, and by that I mean you're not going to have mm. push rods that have bends in them. Uh, you're not going to have push rods that can move around. If you move the wing aileron, let's say the plane is turned off, uh, turned on, sorry, turned on, powered on, but you're not moving the sticks, okay? So the servos should not be moving. And if the servos are not moving and you put your hand to try and move the aileron or the elevator or whatever, uh, not the elevator, but the aileron, and you can see the push rod flexing or it's moving back and forth, or if the aileron can actually move without the servo arm moving, like these are all signs of mm. bad installs. If you're yeah, moving stuff yeah. around and you see the servo move, the whole servo itself is not glued in or screwed in properly and it's moving, <laughs> that's bad. 
that, right. that's really a disaster. <laughs> that's a disaster. But you'll be surprised at how many planes are built like that. What are some other things you've seen? Yeah, I agree. I, I think uh, the worst thing I saw is that uh, there was a, a guy that's selling a DLG to our local pilots from the club. And I saw the the factory when he when he assembled the models and the fraps was totally loose because the home was this disconnected to the mm. to the linkage very easy. That when you push it in the very first time it's locked with, with the linkage. And then when, when you push more, it was loose because he didn't have some uh, system to lock the linkage to the server arms. So mm -hmm. that can be very dangerous when you're launching the the models, yeah. Uh, if if the linkage was loose, so I think for the most of the, because we have a local club here, the situation was better because we have so many options for the newbies. Uh, no matter if you look, don't like this model, you can buy another one very easy. But mm -hmm. most of the club members are very insist to help the newbies to grow up, so they will provide very good service. Sometimes, even made the newbies will feel. Why these guys so good to me? You know, there's some kind there of weird, something weird feelings. <laughs> yeah. yeah, some kind of weird feelings. Why those guys are so kind to me? They even give me for free, or or even help me how to set up everything. And then how to... that that's the spirit. Because most of the guys don't want our model to be in a newbie's hand, and the newbies was don't like it or break it or leave the spot because the new blood of the community can be very, very important to our community too. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, all right, so that kind of covers uh, the gliders. And then we can talk about some gears. Sure. Uh, we can talk so, about some, some radio first. Okay. So what yeah. do we need in a radio? So my contribution to this would be we need five flight modes because you need a launch preset you need a zoom mm -hmm. phase, and then you mm -hmm. need the at least three regular flight modes. So speed, cruise, thermal. So at least five flight modes. And for each flight mode, now this one's very important. You need to have separate trim for each flight mode because there are a lot of entry-level radios where you only have global trim. Now, global trim means, let's say you, okay, let's, let's take it an even one step back more. So you have your elevator stick, and that controls your elevator moving up and down, Okay, using elevator as an example. A trim is to adjust the center of the elevator. So let's say if your plane has a tendency to nose down, then you would use your trim to you know, adjust the center so that it moves it back up a little bit and it flies level. Now, entry-level radios are going to have global trims. So that's just one set of trim mm -hmm. that you... Adjust, uh, affects all the different flight modes. But what you need is separate trim for each flight mode. And that means if you adjust the elevator trim in, let's say, speed mode, it's not going to affect what happens in cruise mode. And that's important because every mode is going to require different uh, trims to be set up properly. What else do you mm. need in a radio? I think for the most of the uh, radios in different brandings, like no matter Futaba, JR, Jetty, Face Guys, most of the mid range, I mean, it's not only the entrance price. Most of the entrance price for uh, from a radio branding, uh, those kind of radio may be not suitable for uh, us to fly in for a long time. So, for the very first time, if you didn't have any radios, I would recommend to buy a little bit higher price, at least it's at the middle range of each branding, like at least a channel or maybe 12 in this kind of ranges because most of the model uh, rows of the radios in that like a channels let's say the jr a channels of the double a channel most mostly they will have the function we need for the dlg file no matter what's the fry mode or like you what you said separate trims or any other function we need like the the, the control the switches are good enough and also for the some right now there's so many choices in the market. I, I will I will try to show some options of the radios, uh, which I have in my stereos now. 
that is very suitable for the beginning, but with a very low prices. Let's take some example of the one I'm frying was the X Lite uh, from Free, Free Sky. This is look like a a game controller, right? Maybe some some people didn't fry the the RC models will feel it's like a game controller, but actually it's it's an open TX uh, system that allows us to do a lot of things, uh, even frying the FIJs without any problems. And it's suitable for the frying with very good prices too. And actually uh, for the some options like the, the Radio Masters TX uh, 16S, this, this radio is very popular also with very good prices, very good looking handed. And uh, it's very cheap too right now in, in the market. You can search it very easy. So for the most of the radio in the market, you need to choose a mid-range product line from each branding. I don't see any brandings that with that kind of uh, prices will not acceptable or is not suitable for finding our guiders. Well, let's just give so, a couple uh, examples. For, let's give yeah. a couple examples. So for an example, FreeSky. Uh, I used FreeSky for several years. And Nick mm -hmm. mentioned OpenTX. So every radio has an operating system, just like your phone or computer. And most of the radios out there uses their own proprietary system. And it's think of it like Apple, right? A lot of it is set up for you. It's much easier to use. FreeSky uses OpenTX mm -hmm. and a couple other uh, brands also use OpenTX, which is completely open source, where you probably have to do a lot more of the mixing and set up yourself. Um, but it is very, very flexible because of that. Now, there is a steep learning curve for OpenTX. I know a lot of people who mm. absolutely love it, like me and Nick. And there are a lot of people who try it for a month and throw it away because they can't figure it out. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, like, yeah. the logical is different. The logic is very, very different. Now, most, mm. I would say almost every single radio that FreeSky currently produces can be used for DLG, okay? And their yeah. prices are really good. Uh, the next one would be Spectrum. Uh, let's only talk about the newest gear from each brand. So with Spectrum, NX6 is probably the cheapest one they have, the most entry level one they have that would still work. Uh, I think it's about $300. If you have the mm. budget, you can choose something like an NX8 or NX10 so that you future-proof it a little bit. Uh, I use the Spectrum iX20. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. With Jetty, Jetty is very expensive. Very flexible system, but they are expensive. Uh, the one that is most suitable for DLG yeah. from Jetty would be the DS12 because all their other ones are way too heavy. If you're yeah. looking at Grobner, I know MZ24 is okay because I had three of those. Is there anything lower? And Even from... 18 is okay for MZ. 18? Okay, 18. so MZ18 would also yeah. work. Futaba, Futaba 16iZ. I have one of those as well. That's their newest radio. I think it's about 500 Even the bucks. old version of TAFG or T14 can be suitable, but this kind of old, older version, maybe you will feel there's uh, less function, but I would suggest uh, 16 also for the iZ yeah. because it's lighter. And, uh, if you're yeah. buying a radio, I always recommend just buy the newest generation. Um, there's just yeah, going to be exactly. more features, more safety protocols, etc. So I'll, I recommend getting the newest ones. Um, I'll try to link mm. as many of these options as I can in the description box below for those who are watching this on YouTube. Uh, so you can go in and take a look through those. What radio are you using, Nick? Right now, uh, just like I said, I'm mostly using the x lights because for the DLG frying is more easier for me to hold it because I, I like light, light radios. And right now, uh, I have the new X20S. Uh, I just got it. Oh, dang. Uh, open box now. I haven't even seen that in person yet. Don't... Yeah, the, the gimbal is very, very good. I, I can tell it's one of the best. Mm -hmm. uh, very nice quality. And also, it's a new model. You can use it for the DLG launching with the switch button here and also uh, a lot of functions there. And, Touch screen. This is kind of new model, but but the prices are very good too. As I you you can search the any, any local dealers to sell the the free sky in in your country. And also I have the uh Tix sixteen. Uh, some new version of the from Radio Master also. So for the for the radio I use, 
why there were so many guys ask, asking me why are you using the X Lite? Because what I want from a radio is that it can fit my all my needs, and the X Lite can do that already. Even with the prices was so low, and also I I like lighter radios, and also because I travel a lot to different cities and even overseas countries, so. Portable is very important for me. So uh, I used the X-Lite for more than maybe two years now. And then I switched some, I, I was trying some new radios also in, in recent time. I know you you are also trying some radios like Spectrum, Futaba, and even Jetty you are wanting to do. Because we, we have a lot, a lot of product can fit our needs. And also you can choose which one you like from the list. It all depends on very personal. That's right. Talking with my own personal preferences, um, I've just as a kind of history, I have I started flying with a Spectrum radio when I first started RC, and then I switched over to a high tech Aurora Nine. I flew that for a year or two, and then after I sold that, I switched over to JR, um, and then I flew for yeah. JR Japan for several years. I flew with the you know, the A channel, XG8, XG14. And these are all really good radios. After that, I flew for Grobner and I used the MZ24. And then I flew for JR again after that until they went bankrupt. Okay, so let's talk about JR and Grobner, the differences between the two. Grobner and JR both have very good quality products. The quality, hardware quality for both and the software like radio link for both are really, really good no complaints at all mm. the mm. for personally i didn't really like the grobner because of the way it felt in my hand in terms of ergonomics and i was never really able to wrap my head around the way that programming or the operating system worked to me yeah i don't know they, they probably have made a lot of updates since then but at the time it just yeah, wasn't already fair. they have has some updates yeah Okay, so it's but probably at the better. time we're using the MZ24, we, we, we do have some function we need, but the system cannot provide it very easily. So we need to add a lot of program. Lots of in, workarounds. In yeah, when yeah, I was using yeah, it, yeah, there yeah. was a lot of workarounds that were required to make it work for DLGs. Now, I went back to JR mm -hmm. because it was so simple to use. The hardware quality was great. Yeah, Radio very simple great. JR super simple to set up. And so I used that for a lot of years until they went bankrupt. And then I started playing around with FreeSky. And with FreeSky... Because of OpenTX, right? That's the only reason. To be honest, yeah. and I don't want to make it sound like we're snobs or anything, but price is not a very big issue, at least for me, uh, in mm -hmm. terms of mm -hmm. radio. I know it's a lot of money. Like, let's say a Jetty radio, 1200 bucks. It's a lot of money and it's a lot of money to me as well. Yeah. But if I look at it in the grand scheme of the hobby, that is about the price of one model, right? And I'm going to have yeah. multiple models per year, but I'm, I'm going to use a single radio for many years. So to exactly. me, saving two, 300 bucks on a radio is not a big factor. I know from talking to a lot of DLG pilots that that's usually the case, especially if they've been flying for a while. Now, of course, when you first start in the hobby or if budget is a issue, then yeah, money is, you know, it's important. And FreeSky offers products that are very, very cheap, but it's a double-edged sword. So personally, I feel that FreeSky makes the best feature set radios, if it works. And the problem is because it's built so cheap, you will get failures every once in a while. I've like, personally, mm. I have my screens crap out on me three times now on three separate radios. Yeah. I've heard of people who had, you know, the lines on their gimbal break off mid flight inside the radio. So suddenly you don't have control because the gimbal is not connected inside the radio anymore. Like there's just a whole host of issue, quality issues with free sky personal experience. Uh, but they have been improving significantly and mm -hmm. I but agree. because of some of these um because of some of these issues it kind of got me earlier this year trying different radio brands 
because I wanted to find something that I yeah. could just use and stop worrying about. And so I had to think of a couple uh, things that I absolutely needed in my radios after using FreeSky. Because again, FreeSky OpenTX, you can do anything you want with it, right? You can have training programs set up for solo practice. Uh, you can set up a lot of different flight mm. modes and the way they interact with each other with like automatically without you having to do anything to the radio when you're flying. So there were several requirements for me that I absolutely needed. Number one, I did not want a three position momentary switch. Uh, when I was using Grobner and JR, the three position momentary switch was the only way that you could use a launch preset. And then once you let go of the three position momentary switch, it would go into the middle set setting and that's zoom. And at the top of the launch, you would push it down into your regular flight modes. But I really don't like this. And again, this is personal preference. Remember that because it works for a lot of people. But the yeah. reason I really don't like it is that's an extra thing you have to do at the top of the launch. And that's an issue for me because, number one, in, when you're at a contest, it's going to be a high-stress situation. And sometimes you might forget to do things that you would never forget otherwise. And I have forgotten mm. to push it from the middle section <laughs> out of Zoom into my regular flight modes. Yeah. So I'm going to be flying. I know that story. <laughs> there are several stories. With right? Zoom all the time. <laughs> I'm flying in Zoom. The yeah. model is just flying like a brick. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? Why is it sinking out of the sky? Right. So that's the first issue. The second issue yeah. is the momentary yeah. switch relies on friction to keep it from going in past Zoom into your regular flight modes. And regardless of yeah, how nice, be disaster. it's a disaster. Regardless of how nice that switch is, either on JR or on other brands, after mm -hmm. you use it for a while, it will get loose and it will skip yeah. Zoom by itself. All right. So that was my first requirement. So it needs to have some sort of logic built into the radio where I don't need to use a three position switch. The second thing is I needed a way. Uh, for it to tell me what the radio link signal strength is or quality is. Because mm. let's take JR again as an example, because I had a lot of experience with it. It is a solid link. But sometimes you might have issues with it that is not because of the radio. In yeah, China, we fly them. signals. Yeah. Exactly. In China, when we were flying JR, sometimes you would have cell, cell towers or you know, sometimes they're mobile Yeah, where it might affect that flying field. Maybe not all the time, but maybe for that day. And you want to know about that before you keep flying that way and the plane flies away forever. So that was another mm. important thing for me. Uh, and thirdly was speech because I've been spoiled by OpenTX, which has speech <laughs> output, right? Yeah. That's a you very, very... You know the time very, and know everything. Yeah. You know That's everything very I'm important going for the, for the new gears now. Very for me, that was very important. So, when I put it out there that hey, I'm trying to look for some new gear, I almost went with Jetty in the end for a variety of reasons. I didn't end up buying it, and then I continued to look. And then there were two that came up to me one was the Spectrum, and one was Futaba. And so, I got both of these. The Futaba again, that was sent to me, I didn't pay for that. Spectrum, I paid for part of it, but I was evaluating these two for my personal use, and unfortunately. Mm -hmm the Futaba missed some of the features that I really, really wanted. I loved the Futaba 16iZ yeah. in my hands. To me, that felt so good, right? And Futaba has a very, very good reputation yeah. on their signal strength. It's always been very highly thought of, and their programming is extremely flexible. It's not as flexible as OpenTX, but it is still very flexible. The issue mm -hmm. is it needed a three-position switch for uh, the launch setup which i did not want that was a hard no for me and it could not tell you signal strength like for an example in my local field that i fly at mm. signal is bad i don't care what radio system you have if you're flying 300 meters or so because we're right in the middle of the city there's a lot of wi-fi around there's a lot of cell towers around signal is going to be crap yeah. so i want to know when my signal goes bad so i don't continue flying in that direction and futaba was not able to offer that and because of those reasons, I had to pass on the Futaba 69Z. And with the Spectrum, it turns out that it had all the functions that I wanted. One thing that people always hear about, especially if they're reading online, is, oh, I have a brownout or crap 
crap signal on my radio and made my plane crash, right? And that was very worrying for me because reliability, like mm. the planes we fly are expensive. So that was one of the yeah. first things that I, I wanted to test. But I had some reassurance because Gavin was flying Spectrum and I know how, fly, uh, how far away he flies. So I'm like, dude, okay, if Gavin can fly at those distances, then it shouldn't be an issue for me, but I really want to test it out. But the great thing with Spectrum is it tells you how many frame losses you have and how many holds you have. And the really cool thing is I've been flying it for several months now. In my local field, I've only ever had one hold. And that means losing signal for about 0.1 seconds or something. And I was very, flying very, very far away in the middle of the city. I had one hold. And that was it. In my regular flying, like my other glider flying fields, my frame rate loss is less than 0.02%. Okay. And for people who understand how significant that is, that is very, very good. Like that is as rock solid as you can get. So now that the, um, the, the reliability aspect of it is solved for me, the next part was the software. Now, Spectrum software is super simple. It's kind of like JR. I mean, they were working together for many years, so it stands to reason to like each other. And so it's yeah. very easy to use for newcomers. The downside of Spectrum, now, nothing is perfect, right? So the downside of Spectrum is, with Spectrum, they don't quite have the receiver selection as FreeSky. And I think that is one of the mm -hmm. really big selling points for FreeSky is to have ultra yeah, exactly. small. Right, exactly. So ultra small receivers, six, four to six channels, they have varials built in, they're tiny. And Spectrum doesn't really have that yet. Now they have a four channel, which is the AR410. It's relatively small. You can fit it in most DLGs. So it's good enough for what I need it for, but it could be smaller, right? And I would love it if they have the Vario feature on board. So when you're practicing launch height, you can fine tune things better. Yeah, I think I think even for the for the Futaba, they they didn't have a very tiny receivers uh, before the new uh, 3004 SB coming out. And then mm -hmm. we have a very suitable for the DLG frying since the, the receivers were. Because right now, for most of the gliders well, we are using, especially the, the DLG market, just like the, take an example, the 6.5 Pro, the, the fuselage is so small that you cannot fit a very, very big part. Most of the regular receiver cannot fit very easy inside it. And even in the very few, uh, even in future, Maybe some of the branding, like the spectrum you talk about, we need to consider about the size of the, the receiver with full ranges, uh, like two antennas with built in. And even like the Fizz guy now, after the, the release of the X, X20, they will have a new receiver called the TD, TD uh, protocol that they combine the 2.4 and the 900 together into one receiver that you can use uh, both protocol as a, as how to say, as a backup uh, system or not? I, I, I didn't, I, I forgot how, right. how to say it. There's a little bit of, there, so with a backup can, system. Yeah, so yeah. normally we use 2.4 gigahertz uh, for our radio, for RC. Uh, there's also been solutions for 900 megahertz because that's a further range. And since it's been available for the last couple of years, that would be two separate receivers inside your mm -hmm. system. And you would have two different yeah. transmitters on your radio to send the signal. And so what you're talking about, the tandem system from FreeSky is it yeah, combines everything into one package. Yeah. And even the, the, the Jetty can can use the same system as a backup system that they, the new models, the DS12 was also provided. But I didn't know there whether they have the the receiver with two systems no. together into one receiver. You would have yeah, two separate yet, no. receivers in that system, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think there will, there will be some kind of very good uh, new design for the market in, in the near future. And as you you may know, the radios develop very, very, in a very fast way that there are so many new generation, new products coming out from one to another. So I think that the choice will be a, even bigger when you when you need to find a good suitable radio for yourself. And just like Thomas said, the personal references can be very different, depends on the personal 
like maybe some other guys want this, some other guy want that. So the best thing is that you need to know what exactly you want and what may be more important for you when you're choosing those radios or maybe you change radios. But every branding we're talking about in the list was suitable for our glider soarings. And also the second thing I want to talk about is that just like I just make a live chat with some Chinese guy uh, hours ago. The thing you need to know is that you need to manage how to set up your radio and know every detail of your radio properly before mm-hmm. you consider to, to use that. This kind of very important. I, I, I heard so many guys who's getting a new radio and, and he didn't spend a lot of time learn how to use it and then throw it away and change another branding. That's not good at all. Because if you didn't know your radios well, how how can you set up your models very easy or change a lot of settings? And how to for the future use of your when you when you fly another category like FIJ have so many servers together and even with the popular motors setting up in different kind of conditions. So knowing how to use your radio is also very important for new beginners. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people do try FreeSky or, or OpenTX in general. I, I keep saying FreeSky mm-hmm. because that's the most prominent radio that uses OpenTX, but Radio Master uses it. Uh, Jumper uses it. Yeah. There's quite a few brands that use a it. A lot of them. Yeah. Lots of brands, yeah. Because there's such a steep learning curve. And the documentation mm-hmm. online is quite lacking. There, there are yeah. references online, but it's not perfect. So to me, my recommendation, I would say go with Spectrum because mm-hmm. it's so easy to set up, especially in, if you're in North America, you will have access to all of the bind and fly products that Spectrum and Horizon Hobby comes. And again, this is not sponsored. Like I'm not a sponsored pilot. I'm not looking for sponsorship. I'm like, this channel is not sponsored. This is purely my opinion of like yeah. what I think is the best. You're going to get pilots at your club locally who are already flying Spectrum. If you go online and have a question, there's thousands and thousands of people on Facebook and RC groups who are using the same radio. Mm-hmm. So it makes it very And easy. one hit, one hit for very important for the beginner, I, I would suggest you, if you have some local pilot fire with you together, do use the same system or radio they are used. Because if you are using another radio, maybe they cannot help you to trim your models, how to have you sitting in the, in the beginning phases. So if you are a new pilot into the DLG market or soaring markets, use at least the same branding, which most of your friends locally used because they will help you how to set up your radio, how to maybe some trainings on uh, how, how to teach you how to fly. If you didn't have the same radio with them, they cannot do that. So mm-hmm. uh, this is one of the, the suggestions I would I was for the new beginners. Okay, so let's finish talking about radios for now. Let's talk about receivers. Mm-hmm. Okay. So yeah. what are some requirements for you to have in a receiver? Uh, for receiver, reliable is the number one factors when you're choosing a receiver. So full range. Because some people will think that when your gliders was flying, it was not very far away. But actually, because of the, the manufacturer, the product includes a lot of carbon in the nose, so, or maybe in the wing or not in the nose on the wing side. So if you thinking about it, the signal is strong enough in other from me machines like the wooden 3D frying machines or in, in some frying wings is good enough. But for carbon products we are talking about now can be some infections or inference on it because of the material we're using. And especially the so tiny the fuselage is, the antenna is themselves inside the fuselage cannot make a very good angle because the, the size didn't allow us to do that. So you can just put the antenna out or you put with some angles inside the fuselage to make it in every direction when you were circling. Uh, you still have the very strong side of the antenna to receive the signal from the radio. That's very important. So for full range is number one, two antenna, the best. And then we can consider about the size and weight. Yes. Uh, two antenna, just to clarify, is because there's so much carbon 
if you only have a single antenna, regardless of how you install it, even if you poke the antenna out and it's dangling outside, there will be orientations of your glider where that is going to be shielded from a direct line of sight to your transmitter uh, with either the carbon wing or tailed or whatever. And so with two antennas, that makes it a lot more reliable and a lot less prone to having shielding. Now, some of the other things that makes it good is end pin. So there are two types of pins on receivers, either a end pin receiver or something that pin comes in from the top. Because of the way that DOG fuselages are, they're small and long, narrow and long, you want end pin. That will make it fit a lot better. And you want four channels or more. Mm. Uh, for me, some nice to haves is telemetry. So voltage is a must. I mean, I think almost all receivers have voltage telemetry now. Most of the receivers have, have the, yeah, yeah. Yeah, most have it, uh, but not all of them have Vario. For an example, the FreeSky receivers like the GRX6 or the GR6, those have Varios. Now, you're not supposed to use them in a contest, and I don't know anyone who actually uses it. This is not allowed. It's not allowed. But for training, yeah. it is really good because it allows you to practice yeah. your launch height. Spectrum does not have it in their AR410. I wish they had, but they do have the AR6610T, which does have it, although it's a little bit bigger. It's a sixth channel. Those are the receivers that I'm using. I'm using you know, the AR410 for almost all of my DLGs right now. What are you using in your planes? Mostly I, will, I, I use the same uh, receiver as you mentioned with the Rario, like the GX series from FreeSky. And I recently, I even tried the Blackshit, Team Blackshit Traces receivers mm -hmm. with, the, with the modules put it up on, on my x Live radio. And the new systems, seems like a little bit better in range because it's more powerful maybe more output power or the the trips of the the system was allowed to avoid the some environment signals loss so i i text the traces also very good for the dlg too and for the new receiver which i mentioned about that the, the new td version from fisca i didn't get it yet because maybe they will announce it in their official side but right now some new receivers we are talking about that the archer series which only allow to use the assess protocol from fisca i also use the the one without the wario to compete in the competition so Mostly because the fish guy uh, receivers was crazy small, so I can put it in every fish large I, I need, even for the FIJ. So that's kind of the rate receiver I use now. Yeah, Free Sky has the best receivers out there. They're super small, full feature set. Again, you do have to do a little bit of quality control yourself after you buy it. Like you have to make sure you check yeah. everything very carefully uh, because, again, because it's so cheap that sometimes you might not have a perfect product. Um, I wish that they would charge a little bit more and just make sure that every mm. unit that comes out yeah, is good. Yeah, I, I always talk to them about the, the products that uh, we, we actually, for the soaring community, we don't care to pay more money on a, on a better quality of the product, even the receiver itself. So I will, I will try to convince them to like up uh, like maybe soaring product yeah. especially for for our needs maybe we, we we are willing to spend more money on a better qc or maybe some higher quality like x lights I, I i was talking to them can you make a like a three thousand imb prizes x light people will buy it for, for our community so uh for every kind of branding they will have pros and cons like what you said Mm -hmm. So we are helping them to provide a suitable and maybe even better quality product in the needs of our sewing community. So right. that's why so we, we need to fans them to, to the support because sewing community is kind of a very small market combined with like maybe they are, have bigger market on other category, but they are willing to do some improvement and development, especially for us. We should fans them for the, for the support of the, our community too. Yes. And it, sometimes it might seem like I'm overly harsh to Free Sky because I really, really like the products. It's just mm -hmm. that it's kind of like having your first love dump you. Uh, so I'm just a little heartbroken <laughs> uh, because of you know, some of the issues I've had with 
the quality, but mm -hmm. it's great to see that they are actively improving their QC uh, from everyone that I've been mm -hmm. talking to. The after sale support has improved quite a bit uh, in the past half year yeah. or so. And they are actively listening to what we want in the products, even though we are a very small and niche community. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about servos. You know, servos are, I would say servos are probably one of the most important things you can spend money on in a VLG because it doesn't matter if you bought the latest and greatest glider. If you put in crappy servos, you're going to have a crappy plane because we need servos that are super precise for the planes to perform the way that they're supposed to. Because even a mm -hmm. you know half a millimeter of difference on the ailerons, for example, completely changes the way that the model flies because of the way they're designed. They're so fine-tuned. So yeah. it has to be small because it, it won't fit otherwise. It needs to have high torque because it needs to prevent the plane from fluttering on launch or blowback. It mm -hmm. needs to be precise so that the plane can actually uh, perform at the way we set it up to trim. And speed is actually a very, very low priority for us. What Some people would like to use the tool as to increase the speed, but it all depends on personal. Some people will think that the faster the speed is kind of important to them. Maybe some was like me, I was a slow flyer. So I don't need very fast responses from the service, but I will want to precisely uh, well with no slope and uh, with uh, a better center quality when, when, when you move the service. So basically I would suggest when you choose a glider, at least 25% of your course on the glider should span on the server side. That will make you a better models and better control of everything. Uh, it's kind of a percentage I suggest about. Some of the popular ones right now are, of course, KSD, which we're both sponsored pilots of. Uh, MKS is also very popular when you're looking at such small and high performance uh, gear. There's not a whole lot of other options out there right now, right? Oh, there's Gluber from Taiwan. They have the A10 series. Yeah, That's pretty Bluebirds. decent. Yeah. Is there anything else? Uh, right now, even even the Free Sky have the new light up of the servers with the X X, which mm -hmm. uh, they will al allow to transfer the the server signals and settings through the protocol to the radio, so you can use the radio to change the settings of the servers. And also, there was some like the black box inside the radio that you can monitor every data of your service. This is a new light up from their product. And also they will have the six meters thin, very, very small one. Uh, just six like millimeters. X, X08 from, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, from, from KST, which similar sizes and also very good quality too. And also there are so many options. I, I was heard that the MKS will have the new six gram service coming out very soon. And I I didn't know when when they will announce it, but there was so many so many new smaller servers right now. Even I talked to the community that we, even for the designer we can. These are these are mostly not in production yet. Like that's not something we can just go and buy right now, right? Or are these already for not sale? Not yet. Okay. Uh, the X O six is ready to sell in even yeah, in the we, arms we, We've sold store. a lot of those already. Yeah. yeah. And also the fee sky, the new service is on, on their shop right okay. now. I, I sell some to in the Chinese market, and the MKS one doesn't come come out yet. Yeah, but they will come out very soon, I think. Just a little plug for KST is not sponsored or anything. Well, I mean I'm sponsored, but they don't know about this video. Uh, but I do want to give a big shout out mm -hmm. to them because I used to fly another brand, you know, one of the other brands that we've been talking about. But we had issues mm -hmm. with some of the quality control of the product. And this was quite a few years ago. And what happened was it led to a lot of crashes in China. <laughs> we Almost every weekend, <laughs> someone would break a plane. Anyway, they, yeah. you know, at first they weren't, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but let's just say they made a very half-assed attempt to fix the issue, in my opinion. And after that, mm. I kind of got fed up with them. 
And even though that was the absolute best servo you could get at the time, there was nothing else that would even mm. come close. Um, I decided to take a chance and find something else, and I found KST. And at the time, they were selling the DS245. I think that was the most suitable servo they yeah, had. Yeah, yeah, for, for, for the slow gliders. Yeah, and it was a lot cheaper than the other servo we were originally using, which I won't name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not trying to start a feud or anything here, but they improved very, very quickly. And they were super receptive, listening to the community on how to improve their products. And exactly. you know, if there's a big reason why the majority of pilots are using KSD. Like that is the if you look at ten planes on the field, chances are most of them are going to be using KST X08 or X06 servos now. That's the second part of it is the support that they give us, not just me as a sponsored pilot, but to the customers. If you have an issue with it. Let's say you bought it from Armsor. If you have an issue with the KST servo that you bought from us, you let us know and we will replace it for you. If there's any sort of widespread issue that shows up on the radar, then they are going to very, very quickly resolve that issue. They're not going to play games with you. Mm -hmm. And that is why... This is very I'm important, the service from the the branding we, we are, we are uh, doing business or maybe we buy with. The, the, the custom service always matters. And also they, the feedback from the pilot side, if, no matter it's a top pilot or normal pilot, the response from the, the feedback is also very important for branding to grow up a, a very good image to the clients and also to the market. So KST was doing a really, really nice job here. Yes. And we have to remember, like sponsorship, I mean, there are exceptions to this rule. There are some people who just take sponsorships and then only says good stuff about mm -hmm. it. For us, the, the brands that we, rep we choose to represent with and partner with, they have to also have a certain reputation to uphold. Because if they yeah. do something bad, that hurts Nick's image, that hurts my image. And for us, mm -hmm. reputation and image is worth so much more than any sponsorship. So there are going to be people listening to this who might feel, hey, we're talking good about KST because we're sponsored. And I just wanted to lay it out there that we've been talking about a lot of different brands today. And even though we get yeah. stuff for free, like most of our stuff is for free, we will talk about the both the goods and the bads of all these different products. And again, like we're not a review channel or anything. But we want to keep our mm -hmm. stuff as unbiased as possible. Because if we recommend something to you that is not good, you're never going to trust us again. And that's yeah. the, the real of it. Let's talk a little bit about batteries. This is going to be quick because we don't have much requirements for batteries. <laughs> yeah. This can be very quick, you know. I just show you some new product from the arms and just find it. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those will be available soon. <laughs> Yeah, so you, you can see there is uh, so many new new product from the Armso series. So this kind of, actually for the DLG market, the battery is not as important as other category like the FPV or some power machines. But uh, reliable qualities and a very good brand and a very good prices is all we need. So just get it. Well, no, there are a few more things that we need. I mean, of course. You want just buy the arms or batteries <laughs> when they're available. I'm not going to yeah. tell you not to buy arms or batteries. They're absolutely awesome. <laughs> um, but there are a few there more are so many. Uh, yeah, yeah. The yeah, first like, thing is that we need to consider is that you, you don't buy a battery without any labels on it. This is very important, okay? Yeah. Because right now in China, <laughs> some other people was fighting from the how to say electronic more that sell thousands of battery without any labels on it. They were thinking about this is cheap price. Just why? DLG didn't why would you use... do that? <laughs> I don't know, because it's so easy to find anywhere in China, you know, in, in an electronic market. So cheap and uh, without any names on it. So, so I, I, I don't know how, how, how they try do those choices, but Right now, we will suggest to use some, at least some with brandings, know what exactly the, the cap, uh, capacity, what was that called? Uh, capacity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what, where it make, where it sells. 
And if you have any problems with the battery, don't just throw away. You need to consider if is the battery uh, issues or uh, cause the damage or not. So reliable is the very important thing for the for the battery. And some category like FIJ and FI FIK, the battery, the specs of the battery is very important because when when you have very short time, very very soft circle when your power system to pro provide very good power with it, the battery itself looks way, way important than, than the other gears now. So you need to choose the battery with a better quality and better branding. So we will suggest a lot of different kind of sizes and different kind of branding to comply with in, in the market. So people will have their own choices also, like maybe the Tartoon series, uh, which I heard is quite common in the use of the FIJ market. You mentioned a point yeah. and that's size, the size of the battery, because in DLG, yeah. we don't really care at what discharge rate it can go and all that. Like that's just not <laughs> important to us. What is yeah. important is it has to fit our gliders. So the form factor and dimensions are very important. Yeah. And that's the only reason why we decided to make the arm sore batteries was because for we, mm. we mainly use one cell. Most DLGs are going to be using one cell LiPo batteries. And that in the last mm. several years is a market that is mostly created to serve small quadcopters like Tiny Whoops and other toy drones like that. And the issue is they have moved away from the form factor that works for DLGs. And so it has become very, very difficult. And I have gotten a lot of complaints from customers that they couldn't find suitable batteries. And so for me, mm. the most important thing was just trying to get something that would fit our planes and fit our products so that people wouldn't have to you know, go onto sketchy sites and buy crappy batteries that they have no knowledge of. And yeah, size is very important because if it doesn't fit in your DLG, there's no use to it. Yeah, in Europe and in US, I don't know whether whether easy to get it or is kind of complicated because it's, in China, quite difficult. Almost every size. Yeah, in because of the internet store in China, the EC is so so popular. You can we can very easy to find any sizes we want any different brandings, very easy. But maybe in Europe or in US, you need to consider you, the sizes. And so what you did right now was providing suitable battery for your product to let the pilots easier to buy everything together in one stop. And that's the clever move, I, I, I would say. <laughs> Not my wife, she doesn't say that. But <laughs> some people say it. <laughs> yeah. Because right yeah. now we, we are talking about a, a suitable size and a suitable range to use in the DLG or maybe in the future, the FIK and maybe FIJ. If you can get everything together in one place and the custom will feel way, way better for the brand they are wanting to buy it and also want to share with the, the friends there. So I think even batteries, even some small stuff, like maybe t-shirts, caps, some uh, usable re equipment. We will, maybe we will talk in the next episode because we are running out of time now. But it, some equipments can be very easy to find and found, like the, the one we were, were talking about, the Aeropass even even supported the very long fishing pole to rescue the, the landing on trees models coming back yeah. so that kind of equipment we will talk about in the next episode right so this is very important too to get it uh, easier and for the daily use we are going on uh, air films and have fun with the sorry so that kind yeah. of equipment we will talk in the next episode right yes we'll talk about equipment tools things like that in the next ne the next time we speak with nick that's it. I think that's it for today's episode. Well, Nick, it's been great to have you on with us again. Everyone, if you enjoyed it, please remember to give it a thumbs up. Watch some of our other Camber Up episodes. Uh, you can you know, go back and look at the Camber Up clips if you would like. And we'll see you in the next video. Thanks, Nick. Cheers. Bye-bye.